welcome to, to the uh, second uh, uh, Research and Progress Seminar for this spring semester. Uh, and I'll just put a plug in here for our devoted long-term uh, partners, the uh, RETN uh, network, uh, that we're, we're uh, acknowledging how glad we are to be partners with them. And uh, if you have not already done so, we encourage you to go online to their website and uh, click a few of the things that you click and find the survey uh, where you can indicate uh, community response, community uh, appreciation for what they do, recognition for what they do, because they're in the process of uh, uh, being looked at, uh, looking at themselves and being looked at. And I think the, uh, any, any little bit like that helps. I know that we all appreciate them uh, very much. This evening's talk is, uh, our, our guest speaker is uh, Center Member Jane Beck, uh, Executive Director and Founder of the Vermont Folklife Center. She now has emeritus status at that uh, institution. Uh, she comes from Ripton. She has, uh, I guess I'm moving backwards here, Vermont Folklife Center from 1983 until retirement uh, in 2007. Received a number of grants and awards, including the Governor's Award for Excellence in Arts in 2004. She's the author and the writer-producer of many publications and media, uh, publications, media productions. And really going backwards, we have uh, the, uh, the, the basic credential, the PhD, in uh, folklife studies from the University of Pennsylvania. She's going to talk to us tonight on a topic that we all find interesting uh, and especially appropriate in Black History Month, uh, Journey's End, Destination of a Dream. And so I hope you'll all join me in welcoming Jane back. Thank you for coming. Thank you for that nice introduction. Uh, makes me feel older than God, <laughs> which I am. Uh, it's very good to be here tonight and have the opportunity, um, thanks to UVM and the Center for Research on Vermont, to be able to present the stuff I've been doing, the research. Uh, Often a researcher does it in isolation, and it is good to be able to bring it to you, get some critical feedback, uh, so thank you for being here. I'd like to start off and tell you a little bit about Daisy Turner, who I met in 1983, I was sent a clipping by Margaret MacArthur, who told me she was a wonderful storyteller. And at that point, I was working for the Arts Council. And I thought uh, it would be important to bring an African-American storyteller on video to the schools. Daisy had been born in Vermont in 1983, the daughter of slaves. And uh, as I went to see her, I realized what a wonderful storyteller she was. And I went to see her once a week, and then maybe once every couple of weeks, and for a period of three years. And as you do that, your relationship changes. And at that point, I was going to Washington quite a lot. I would do some research on some of the stories she was telling me. And um, as I said, our relationship changed. She wanted me to do a book um, on her stories. Now, her stories were certainly events in her own life, but ma ma mainly um, the stories of her father and um, his life in slavery. And she felt that a book would get more credence than an oral narrative. I didn't feel uh, that maybe I was the person to do it, and I spoke with several of my African-American 
friends and colleagues, and they all urged me to, to do it. And um, I thought about it some more, and finally I said to Daisy that I would do it, but I couldn't get to it until after I retired. And I promised to do it, and so here I am, retired, uh, working away on this. Now, it was really the story of her father that I feel is so important. This is an oral narrative, multi-generational, across four generations. And how often do you get that coming out of slavery? It's a story he told his family over and over, almost word for word. And so you get his feelings, you, you get what he feels is so important. The, um, when he first began to understand he was different, that the wretchedness of slavery, uh, that he could be sold as a breeder when he was 12, uh, that the importance of learning to read when he escaped, the importance of killing the overseer, this was symbolic. You get all of this in his own words, and it's very seldom that people that came out of slavery really talked about it to their family. And here he would, every night, every other night, he would sit down and tell his family these stories. So I think that's the importance of it. It's, it's an insight we don't often have the opportunity uh, to see. Now, Alec and Daisy always start with Alec's grandmother, Daisy's great-grandmother, who was an Englishwoman who went out to Africa on her honeymoon in one of her father's trading vessels from London the ship was wrecked, her husband was drowned, and she was saved by an African chieftain's son who was a great swimmer. And um, how do you find I, I, the ship, the woman uh, who goes out to Africa? And because this was the first part of the story, I felt this is where my research should start. And I made a few bumbling um, attempts. Alec was called Alec Berkeley. And his father was known as Robert Berkeley. And his brother, George Berkeley. And I thought the Berkeley name must have some significance. So I began to look. Daisy always said that it was an earl or a lord, and there was Berkeley Castle near Bristol, and I thought, hmm, this, this sounds good. Well, I, I read everything I could about the Berkeleys, um, and they sounded logical, but there were no daughters that disappeared. Uh, there, there was a two-year-old who was just the right age, and then I discovered she died in at two, and another one that was possible, but she lived to 45. Um, so I had to close the book on that, and then I started to go through uh, Lloyd's, uh, Lloyd's list of all the wrecked ships. And I'll tell you, that took me some time. And I started 1795 to 1805, pushing it up a little more, finally, to 1810. And I, I, I finally found a ship that I, I thought might be a possibility that was lost on the coast of Africa. No, no particular uh, detail. And as I researched this ship, I discovered it was owned by a man called Alexander Anderson. And his uncle, Richard Oswald, had started a firm a merchant firm in London, and it had become very successful. And when he died in 1784, he left 500,000 
pounds, which is many millions of dollars. So here was the successful element, maybe not an earl or a lord, but he was wealthy. And he left this firm to his nephews, John and Alexander Anderson. And um, he was involved in the slave trade, and he owned Bant's Island, which was one of the few forts that was privately owned. And it was a, a, a major slaving port. And uh, the two nephews, John and Alexander, continued this. Slavery was outlawed in 1807. And um, suddenly, their main source of income disappeared. And at that point, John Anderson died. And Alexander continued to try and um, make a living through trading legitimately uh, in Africa. And uh, this is here is Sierra Leone. And that was where Bant's Island was. And then you come around. And these are the forts that uh, the English government owned. And coming around here, uh, this is uh, the place that I think the vessel that was owned by Alexander was, was wrecked. The ship, or brig, was um, 75 feet in length. And she um, stopped, I think, at Cape Coast Castle. Daisy always talked about the ship going to Cape Town. And for a long time, I thought that this was South Africa. And then after reading a great deal of stuff on Cape Coast Castle, I realized the town was called Cape Coast. And it is just a short distance uh, from Cape Coast Castle uh, down to Waida and Lagos. And this is Yoruba country. And one of the uh, things I was able to do was do genetic testing on the son of a son of a son of Alexander um, Turner. And uh, it came out Yoruba. And this, between Waida and Lagos, is Yoruba territory. So I think, I haven't made a, a strong case yet, because I don't know definitively. I have just gotten a collection of Alexander Anderson went bankrupt. And there is a whole collection of uh, underwriters and bills and, and stuff. And I'm hoping maybe to find something. But every time I give up on Alexander Anderson, something else makes me think that this is the man. And uh, I was give, giving up because I, he had a, a daughter. But she would only have been 15. And I realized that yes, people were married earlier, but 15 sounded a little young for me. And I was going through the baptismal records and then the marriage records, and I discovered that actually he had a niece that he was bringing up as a daughter who was married June 10th, just before the ship, the brig, uh, whose name is Jane, uh, sailed. So I'm hoping that I can nail it down more. But for the moment, this looks to be um, uh, the, the ship and, and the family. Now, the young girl, whose name is Elizabeth Webb Anderson, uh, as I said, was saved by an African chief's son. And she never returned to England. Uh, she had a child by the, the, her savior. And uh, this, is, this will have to be my last part of my research. But one of the things I'd like to throw out to you is 
at some point, I've got to go to Africa and um, see if I can find any stories along the coast of a white woman that was shipwrecked. So that, that will be um, hopefully the, the last part of this research. The um, other interesting thing about uh, the couple, they, they had a son, and they name this boy Alexander, after Alexander the Great. Now, naming customs are very important among the Yoruba, and I bet you that um, Elizabeth was really naming her son after Alexander Anderson. And she probably heard him say, I'm named after Alexander the Great, the only man that w uh, the, uh, was never defeated in battle. And um, this, she was smart enough about uh, traditions among the Yoruba to know how important this naming custom was and also what kinds of characteristics uh, you would want a name uh, to carry. And Daisy was always very clear that it was the English woman who named the son and who, who had this interest in history. The son grew up with an English-speaking mother and uh, she apparently schooled him at home. He was a bright lad and uh, became involved in the slave trade and uh, apparently traded with Yankee captains until he was captured as a slave himself and was then carried to New Orleans. I think on the Phoenix, uh, which was a schooner that had 91 uh, slaves on board and got to New Orleans with 74. And the, the African who became known as Robert um, always said it was a terrible voyage and how many uh, slaves were lost. He was sold on the auction block cheap because he was arrogant and a troublemaker. And that, was, um, that wounded him as well. He didn't like being sold cheap. And he certainly wasn't going to be a slave. He was sold to John Golden, and he made life miserable, and um, life was pretty miserable for him as well. He was carried back by mule train to Port Royal, Virginia, and Golden's plantation on the Rappahannock. And uh, the overseer came to Golden and said, I can't do anything with this African. And Golden apparently was a gaming man, and said, all right, let's set him to fighting Gamecocks and boxing. And this is um, really the underbelly of slave culture. We know very little about the boxing matches. We know that a lot of money rode on them, and we also know that there was a lot of drinking. But other than that, uh, Molyneux, who is actually featured in this uh, sketch, uh, got his freedom uh, for winning a, a boxing match, and his master uh, won a great deal of money. And I wonder um, how much money uh, Golden won um, on Robert's uh, boxing, but he became a champion and he would go off for a week at a time with Golden fighting these matches all around the South. He fought where Georgia and North and South Carolina come together and that is um, a place called Schaefertown and it was uh, where there was a Cherokee reservation. And he, stayed with the Cherokee and asked Golden if he could bring home a Cherokee wife. Now this seems a little far-fetched because here the Cherokee woman would have been free 
Why would she go into slavery? But think about the time. It was roughly 1835, just before the Trail of Tears. Here was Robert riding on a mule, dressed finely, a champion, and maybe love was involved as well. And anyway, she did go home with Alec, he was uh, with Robert. They were married in a traditional Cherokee ceremony and uh, went back to Port Royal, Virginia. Robert continued to box until he killed a Jamaican in the ring and then refused to fight anymore. And he uh, apparently was very good with a cir circular saw and uh, began building uh, buildings. He was building a wheat barn. The rafter fell on him and he was crushed to death and uh, buried in the slave graveyard, which is back through this window. Alec was at that point three, four. He can just remember uh, the, Sarah, the uh, funeral and has a number of, of stories about that. Now, I, I spoke about the, the question of, you know, how much money Golden might have made uh, from these boxing matches. It certainly is evident that after 1835, he really begins to buy land. And perhaps I can get at that through the land taxes and, and his land purchases. Another interesting thing is that in 1847, Golden was one of several men who broke away from the Liberty Baptist Church and set up the Bethesda Baptist Church with the main tenant of temperance. And I just wonder if perhaps that didn't have something to do with killing the Jamaican in the ring or the drinking at boxing matches. We probably will never know, but uh, the stories that Alec and Daisy told make you uh, consider that possibility. The Bethesda Church was certainly a way that the masters controlled the slaves. Uh, and the slaves attended church up in the balcony. Uh, religion was a very strong tenant in Alec's life. Um, he not only attended church and, and felt the power of prayer, he loved singing the spirituals in work and also in the slave quarters where they would have religious meetings maybe once a week. But the uh, formal church was a way for the masters really to um, control the slaves. And they would call up the names of different slaves who might be found for stealing or, or something of this nature. Um, now, from Golden's will, we know that Rose's cabin, Rose was the Cherokee woman, um, Alec's mother, was right around here. And over here is the big house. And the mistress, Mistress Golden, would come down uh, and, and see Rose and, and oversee the sewing. And her granddaughter, who was eight, uh, was having a birthday party and Rose was making a, a dress for her. At that point, Alec was five and he began to notice that he was dressed differently than the white children. And he, did, he was in a sort of a smock, no shoes, and he asked his mother why he was dressed differently. She didn't say anything to him, but 
she made him a pair of red moccasins, which he was thrilled with. And he strutted around with them, and he was just as pleased as Punch. But he noticed that every time a white woman or a white, any white people were around, his mother would take the moccasins off him. One day, he was wearing them, and Mistress Golden came down, saw the red moccasins on him, took them off, threw them in the fire, and Alec went berserk. He bit her, he scratched her, he hit her, and she fell in a swoon. And he remembered looking up, and all he could see was the awful look in his mother's eye. And she was afraid that he was going to be sold away from her off the plantation. Well, that didn't happen. Um, he was, at that point, five. Uh, and, and this is a, a, the kind of cabin they lived in. Uh, she sewed here and finished the dress. And they carried it up to the big house and into the hall, which, at that point, was there were tables full of sweetmeats and cookies and all good things. And they walked by these up, these sort of enclosed stairs, upstairs to take the dress to, to Zephy. And um, Rose fitted it, and then everything was perfect. She called her son. He was already ahead of her coming downstairs, and he grabbed there were a bunch of soldier ginger cookies. I mean, he's so specific, and he bit the heads off the soldier ginger cookies. <laughs> and of course, got in trouble all over again. And uh, this time was given the punishment of carrying water to the slaves working in the fields. And this, this plantation, um, T today, the fields are still open. You can go down there. There's been very little development. And you can just sort of see how it must have been. But he had to, he hated the overseer, who he called, his, I think the overseer's name was Presley. Alec always referred to him as Pusley. And um, he, so, this was his punishment. Imagine five years old going down the, with two heavy buckets, going down the, the row of, of working slaves, bringing them water. Now, after he got over this, he, he had other chores like cleaning out the stables, carrying the sheep to pasture, the cattle to pasture. Then um, he worked in the milk house and worked his way up to head boy in the milk house. And it was here that the mistress's granddaughter, and I think her name was Zephy. She was, her name was Josephine Broadus. And uh, she brought her little primer down to teach Alec how to read. And they spent quite a bit of time. Alec actually began to learn how to read. and. Uh, Zephy told him that if he could get away to Vermont, he would be free. And furthermore, she would help him. And I've, uh, again, I, I wonder, being the granddaughter, whether there was a generational difference here, whether she really was an abolitionist, or whether you know she just was fond of Alec and wanted to help him um, become free. At any rate, uh, her grandmother caught them and sent Zephy to the house and lashed Alec with her whip. And he held on to the primer and bled on the primer, but she couldn't get it away from him. This primer became a symbol, uh, and he carried it throughout the Civil War and eventually did bring it to Vermont. Now, he did all kinds of other things. And, and he learned um, a lot of things that he eventually employed in Vermont. One of these was digging ditches. Uh, he also was involved in seining. And this was an 
occupation that they use spirituals um, to sing and, and, and use the rhythm to uh, haul in the fish. And here is Francois Clemens singing uh, the spiritual. Alec taught Daisy all the songs, or many of the songs, that he knew. And he told her when he used them. And this has been a listening all the night long, and this was one that he used uh, while saining. I also might tell you that Golden went to the Baptist church and asked in just before saining season if he could pay his servants, as he referred to the slaves, a dram of liquor. Now, this is the temperance church, uh, and, and I find that an interesting uh, piece of information. I guess we gotta listen to the whole thing, sorry. Okay. Um, they would bring the seine net up on a cart uh, to, uh, and, and the fish net. It, it would be full of fish. And this was an alternate to the diet of salt pork and, and corn uh, bone. Now, about this time, uh, there had been shots fired on Fort Sumter. And Caroline County, which is where the plantation is, was located halfway between Richmond, which became the head of the Confederacy, and Washington. And so there were soldiers coming from both sides. And some Confederate soldiers in the winter of 1862 camped out on the Golden Plantation. And in, in a closet in the house is this uh, writing that says, um, you know, two bed quilts, a calico blanket um, that the Confederates uh, used. And Golden actually tried to collect um, money at the end of the war, but was never successful. But at this time, too, there, there were Yankees, the 1st New Jersey Cavalry, on the other side of the Rappahannock. And Ferdinand Dayton, who was the assistant surgeon, uh, came over to um, Alec's side and actually met Alec. And it was at that point he arranged uh, to, uh, uh, that on a certain day he would wave a sheet and uh, Dayton would come over and get him and whoever else he had in tow and they would make their escape. And this, he had, he had been planning this really since uh, he, he, Mistress Golden had lashed him and he knew he had to get away. And so sure enough, um, he was able to come down to the river and Dayton came and got him. And then, uh, the first night they were there, he led a raid back to the Golden Plantation. Now, Alec tells the story that he led the raid, and the chaplain of the 1st New Jersey Cavalry also talks about the raid. Broderick, who is, is this person, was the uh, captain who, who led the raid, and 
two slave boys. The first one is Humphrey, I'm sure the second was Alec. And they <coughs> excuse me, crossed the Rappahannock. And then uh, this is Thomas Golden, Golden's son, which had a house that was shielding nine men, non-Confederates, non-Vedettes. Uh, and this is who uh, the 1st New Jersey Cavalry were after. And so they went to the house, they surprised the nine men, killed one of them, and then uh, raided all the stores on, on the plantation. And meanwhile, Alec went to the overseer's cabin and shot Pusley. And this was, really became one of his important stories. Here he triumphed over slavery. Pusley was the symbol to him of slavery. And uh, he, this was the first person he shot in the Civil War. And it, it was um, a very important happening. Now, Alec uh, worked as an orderly for Ferdinand Dayton throughout the Civil War, uh, carrying um, wounded, uh, uh, driving the ambulance, um, and uh, he made a number of contacts uh, that helped him later on in life. Uh, after the war, Dayton got him a job at Cameron and Osborne, a, a grocery store, but also uh, helped him go to night school in engineering. And then he had also met a guy called A.H. Merrill, who ran a slate quarry in Maine, and he carried ex-slaves to, Ma to Maine uh, to work in the slate quarry. At this time, he also met Sally Early, who became his wife. Obviously, this is an older photograph. Sally, at that point, was all of 14, um, and was the daughter of Jubal Early and his slave, Rachel. They went to Maine and immediately had twins and then another child, and Sally got quite ill. They came to Boston to find a doctor. Alec got a job on the railroad, and he met Charles White and Vestas Wilbur, men who ran a sawmill in Grafton, Vermont. And uh, when he heard that Vermont was a very healthy place, he decided that this was where he was going to move. And he came up, they wanted him to bring some other ex-slaves, and he came up to Vermont, I think there were six of them. And here um, he'd escaped slavery, and he really came to Vermont where he faced racism. And uh, the, the newspaper said, um, Half a dozen Negroes came into town. The women were frightened at seeing so many, but they walked peacefully two miles south, pitched their tent, and now are engaged in cutting uh, wood. Alec was told that he would not be able to earn enough to put salt in his bread, uh, and he was determined that he was going to show them. And he had a blacksmith make him a five pound ax. Um, most Vermonters used a three and a half pound ax. And he became known as a strong man. And uh, here is one of the stories that became legend and, and really did a great deal in um, people having respect for Alec because Yankees or Vermonters respect the strong man. Bill Wyman said, if you could carry a barrel of that flower to Sally and the children on the hill, I'll give you. Well, Father said you were lost, and I'll, I'll take it up, and I go. So Father 
finally got ready and got started. So he put the vial of flour and he told me uh, many a time just how to do it. Just right on the side of his shoulder and started. When he got to the bridge, the first bridge over there, he didn't take it all, but he changed it like that, a little like that, over just a little bit further, because he said he found out he knew he had to make the hill and the ground would have to lay a certain way then. So he shifted it then and went home. And my father, glory to his name, Alexander, my father, and Charles <coughs> the Lord, went on up that road and up that hill and across that long field, because we lived in the shanty, and my father never set that barrel down until he got up in the shanty door. And that must have been at that time, 40 men all followed him with, <laughs> with <laughs> them jugs of Jimmy John and hard <laughs> cider and all. And mother told many a time how after they all got up, they all got drunk. <laughs> After father set the down of cider down and they all was saluted him and congratulated on him. And my father carried that barrel of flour from Grafton Village up on our hilltop for us children to eat to have bread. Now that's the truth if I never speak a word again. She's quite a storyteller, isn't she? Anyway, Alec cleared the land and then was able to buy it cheap. And he finally bought 150 acres on uh, what became known as Turner Hill. He built um, his dream house. And here's an interesting fact. He built it uh, over a spring. And he kept a trout in the spring. And I remember thinking, what an interesting idea. And then when I went down to the plantation, I discovered the, plant, plant, the plantation house was built over a spring. And uh, so many of his ideas, really, he took in everything. Another, uh, and then building barns. You saw the early barns uh, on the plantation. Again, the architecture is the same. And he was able to uh, create a farm that uh, worked for him and worked for his family. And he was able to bring his family together. And it was an extended family. And uh, you know, you read about how slavery broke up families. His bro half-brother came, his brother-in-law. He had his mother-in-law. It was a large extended family. Uh, and and uh, his wife's brother, who was driving the, uh, the uh, snow roller here. And his grandchildren, many of his children, uh, he had, um, let's see, 13 children. After he'd had seven, he called one enough. And he was known as Nuffy. And um, after that, he had six more. Uh, but he had uh, nine daughters and two sons that lived. And many of his daughters went down to Lexington, Mass, where uh, they could find other African Americans and find work. Um, and then they would send their children back to Vermont, and Vermont really became the family seat. And here are Alec and Sally. And uh, these are just a series of photographs showing you life in Vermont. Uh, this, the second one is, is Daisy here, the arrow on her. And these, this, is um, Willie and Wilhelmina. They were twins. But the, I, I've got a series of photographs. This is Rose, who was one of the oldest daughters with Rachel. They were twins. 
And just to give you a feeling of the family, Lindsay Turner um, and William were the two sons that lived. And this is Daisy, looking very fashionable. And many of the daughters that stayed in Vermont married white men. And Alec was not happy about that. He, he adjusted. Uh, Violet married George Hall, who was um, from a well-known family in Chester. And Zebby was named after the Little Misses. And this is why I think that Josephine A. brought us as she's declared in the, all the censuses, was really, her nickname was probably Zephy. Um, Zebby was the first daughter born in the new house. So this, again, was a tribute uh, to the young girl that taught Alec how to read. And this is the youngest Turner daughter, Florence, Florida, excuse me. And the little boy is known as Lindsay. He was, Lindsay had a couple of children with a local woman, and it is that family that I was able to um, test, uh, do the genetic testing. And uh, actually, several years ago, I got a call from a woman who said, I've just discovered that Lindsay Turner was my great-grandfather. And she was as white as, as I am and um, had no idea. And when her mother had gone to try and get her passport to um, Ireland, she had to go back and find her father's birth certificate and noticed M, mulatto, and went to her mother and, and asked, and um, it turned out that, that she was Lindsay Turner's granddaughter. And the thing about the Turners were they were very inclusive. When uh, the, the, these, these children were born and, and then their children and grandchildren, they were always invited up to the Turners, even, even though uh, they didn't realize there was any relationship. And here is a group of the Turner family. They always returned on holidays. Again, the importance of family, the family seat. And this is Alex's last birthday. He um, was 78, and he died the following December, December 20th, uh, the, his nine daughters were pallbearers. And um, he was drawn to uh, the graveyard uh, in, a, in a sleigh, because he didn't want anything as newfangled as an automobile. And um, was, was buried just before Christmas. And so here is a life that went from slavery to freedom and to somebody who built a strong identity, a strong sense of self, a strong family, and built also a house, a farm, and a place for his children to come. And, and I think that's quite a tribute to a man. OK. Uh, any questions? Any comments? <laughs> what? What a story. It, it's an incredible story. Did, did, did children and grandchildren buy neighboring plots and expand? Their acreage? The, there are a number of, the, the grandchildren now are really dying off. And there are a number of great grandchildren who are still in Vermont. Interestingly enough, most of these 
great-grandchildren are, are blend right in. They're, they're white. Um, and in fact, when I did uh, the, when we did the um, Daisy Turner video, there were some, there were twin, I think they were great, great grandsons of Alec Turner. And they were blonde, towhead twins. And nobody believed that they were Turners. And they became instant celebrities in their school when the video was shown, uh, which is interesting kind of reverse uh, discrimination. So when did Alec die? Alec died in 1923. He was born in 1845. So, uh, and, and Daisy uh, died in 1988. But she, she really told these stories almost word for word the same, whether they were word for word the same as Alec told them, I, I don't know. One, one of the things I find interesting is you talked about Rappahannock, Virginia, and Caroline County, and I was telling you earlier that one of the Buffalo soldiers knew uh, Daisy Turner, and that's where he was from, was from oh, really? Caroline County, Willis Hatcher, who was a 10th Cavalry soldier that came to Vermont. And so now I'm wondering if it's possible that they may have known each other earlier or have known, you know, uh, had that commonality. It, it could have been, because Alec, as I said, did bring up um, six other men, and and most of them, I think, went back. Uh, his brother went back and, and worked in the Boston market. Some stayed. And they, too, blended into the community after three or four generations. Um, so it's hard to, to know. Yeah? Will the uh, Daisy Turner video ever be shown again? I know you, you showed it on PBS, did you not, at some point? You, you can talk to Brent Bjorkman um, about that. I think that the Vermont Folklife Center has uh, copies of it. Right. It's just been transferred. Last year, um, shortly after I came on board of Dr. Jane, um, we transferred to DVD, so it's available on DVD, with also uh, PDFs on there, too, teacher's guides, and then more of the information about it. The family and the African Americans. And she was she was over a hundred when she died, right? She was. She was one hundred and four. Yeah, she was. She was amazing. So, what are the big gaps that you have now in your in your research? What what uh, you alluded to a couple things, but well, I have a what, a, are, you, what a, are you doing right now? And what do you do next? Well, I'm, I'm at the moment going through this collection of um, Alexander Anderson's bankruptcy stuff. But then I need to um, go down to Cherokee country and see what I can find out. I had thought that I would be able to find out about these boxing matches through newspapers. But there's nothing in newspapers, or, or anyway, that I can find. Um, and uh, I'd like to, there's a Cherokee museum I want to, that has some archives that I'd like to do some work in. Uh, I need to uh, take a look at the Phoenix. The Phoenix seems like the most likely ship that the schooner that, that um, Alex's father came over on. But I want to find out more about it, see if it was a New England ship, which it was supposed to be, see if that fits in. What about uh, property records in, in Virginia that, would, uh, that might include slaves? You, you, uh, how much investigation have you done with, with the... Uh, I, I've, I, I've poured over, over those, yeah. Um, I've, and, and I found Golden's Will, and that mentions a number of, of slaves. And interestingly enough, um, he left Alec's brother and sister to Josephine Broadus. Um, 
which I thought must have meant that she really had a connection with Alec and his, his family. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you.